Welcome to episode 178 of Missing Pieces. This is my weekly audio journal podcast where I talk about what I'm up to and what I'm into. And the funny thing is, last week's episode, I recorded a day early, fully anticipated that because I knew Clark Mann was going to be off on Friday. It just so happened to be that there were community yard sales that day. So we went around and had a bunch of fun at all those. And it was just a nice day where I completely took off from the world of podcasting. I did, of course, record my video that day, but it was just like a bonus day. It was a Friday, Saturday, if you will. If the day before was a Thursday, Friday, that became a Friday, Saturday. It was great. This week, surprisingly similar situation, only I anticipated going to community yard sales because these were like the last ones of the year. And I keep saying, this is my final yard sale day of the year. And it just keeps kind of like becoming a lie, an unintentional lie. But these community yard sales, we had never been to before. And I heard they were good, but I fully anticipated that Clark man would get on the bus that morning. We would go out yard sale and I'd be back by noon and just ready to record this podcast and tell you all about all the great things that I found. Well, we're going to do that. It just happens to be a day later because today is now Saturday. And when you believe it yesterday, I didn't get home until like right before Clark Man got home, which was like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It was crazy. I heard from one person that there were over 200 yard sales that were like posted and there were even more. It was literally like the entire town had come together and everyone was having a yard sale. Like all of the front porches were filled, all of the, the backyards, the garages, everybody was yard selling. There were people like lining up the streets with their cars. In fact, there was one moment where I tried crossing the street and I had to wait for like five minutes for all the traffic to go through because apparently during yard sale days, uh, pedestrians don't have the right of way. It's, it's cars. So, uh, you know, everybody's out there trying to find their treasures and their deals, which is why I, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, why I love yard sales. It's the closest thing to becoming a treasure hunter that you'll ever have. And I love just looking around and everything that you see and everywhere you go is a surprise. Nothing's planned out. And I love that from a guy that's typically a planner. But we had an awesome day yesterday. In fact, I'll give you like a recap of my highlights from the past two weeks uh, because I left you before we went to the last one. So last Friday, we went out yard sailing. Some of my highlight finds, I would say the coolest thing that I found was this giant bag of Skylanders. If you don't know what Skylanders are, um, imagine Lego Dimensions. Some of you know what that is because this formerly was a Lego channel. And I know I have a, a large Lego fan base that continues to watch my content. Thank you. Because that's, that's a passion of mine too, as is yard sailing. But uh, Skylanders are video games to life type situation where it came with two different games, two games for the Wii, and this power pad. And essentially what you do is, and this is just like a big scam from these video game companies, uh, they want you to buy these real life action figures or figurines that when you put on the base, they have like a little computer chip in the bottom of them. Don't let me get into the technical things of this because I can't. You put them on the base, the base is plugged in or has like a dongle that connects to your console. And whatever character you buy in the real world that you make your mom and dad run out and get for you and pay for you, that character then becomes unlocked in the video game. So instead of you buying a video game and playing it and unlocking characters and just having fun with your initial purchase, with Skylanders, you get to buy the video game and have fun with the limited characters they give you. And then if you want more, from what I understand, like they kind of hype it up to you that you should definitely run out to a physical store or Amazon or whatever, and then go buy more characters for the game in real life. So it's a genius thing from the perspective of the video game creator, but not so good as a consumer. But it is kind of fun though, like if you love collecting figurines and things and you wanna have them on, on display, it's fantastic. Uh, but the thing was, was hot for a little bit and then it kind of trailed off and now it's, you can find them at yard sales. But I ended up getting a great deal on this because again, there were two Wii games in there, both Skylanders games. The whole bag was filled. Like this is a giant bag full of these things. And also included in there was a Bowser Amiibo. I ended up paying $5 for all of this, which I thought was crazy. Like they probably should have like 15, 20 bucks on this thing. Got it for five and I looked up the Bowser Amiibo as we left and he sells for 10 bucks. So I doubled my money just on Bowser. But inside there, I also have a whole crap ton of Skylanders, which all sell for like $5 a piece. So I'm going to list them all on eBay for $5 uh, for each one of those, which I think there's like 20 of them. And then the base itself goes for like 10 bucks. So I might end up clearing like 120 bucks off this $5 investment. I just think that's so cool. And it's like one of the reasons that I love going out and hunting for stuff because I've gone beyond the realm of just looking for things that I want 
like in my collection. Like personally, I, I don't really care for, for Skylanders or want to have them. But when I introduced the eBay aspect of this, it's made this year's yard sale season so much more fun for me. So that was like the big score that I got. Clark Man, his big score was this Hot Wheels track. You guys know we've been kind of having this resurgence of Hot Wheels. I got him this super six lane raceway thing uh, like two weeks ago now. And we've been playing with that like crazy. And I came across this thing that was $15. It was this big like tote of Hot Wheels tracks and a couple cars were in there and all these different play sets. And I offered him 10, they were happy to take it. So we brought that home. Clark Man was going crazy with that. We did that last weekend. That was a nice score for 10 bucks. Uh, I also got, uh, we found one Lego score. Last week was almost the first time that I went out and didn't find Lego, but at our, our very last yard sale. In fact, we had gone out for lunch, we'd wrapped up for the day, but we found one last place, ended up finding this Lego Crater Shark that we already owned a couple times over but it was 50 cents, so we had to grab that. And it was really great because Clark and I came home that night and we shot a video of Clark making a, a mech out of it. And in that video, it wasn't just like him sharing his experience building that, but it was us discussing the, the activity of being a Lego mock builder, which a mock is like when you make your own things out of Lego. It's what most kids do with Lego. If you hand them a pile of pieces, they make a mock and anyone can do it. So we were trying to give advice and ideas to people just getting started out. And I thought that was really cool because I don't want my Lego channel just to be like a, here's what we bought, here's what we built type thing. I want it to be a thing that encourages people out there. Cause again, I know I have a younger audience and if I could be the guy, instead of being like, Hey, look at all the stuff that I bought to being the guy that's like, Hey, we got this thing for 50 cents and we're playing around with it and we're making something cool out of it. And you can do that too, regardless of how big or small your Lego collection is. I think that can be a powerful thing. And I'm not trying to be somebody special or anything like that, but I feel like if you have a platform where people are engaged with your content, why not use it for something good, right? Not to say that other people don't. I just, I don't know. I just feel like that's a, that's the direction I've been trying to go for a long time. And hopefully, hopefully it's hitting the right people that it needs to hit out there. So that was pretty neat. I also got the a book for Clark and I to read, Hobbit, The Hobbit by uh, Tolkien, and i um, excited to read that with him. We're going to read that bit by bit in the evenings and the mornings and stuff like that to, to get through that, because I think Clark would really enjoy that, and then maybe we can get into Lord of the Rings after that, and who knows where we'll go from there, but that was only 50 cents as well, so that, that was at the same yard sale as the shark, so we got a, a Lego set and a book, $1 spent, that was pretty neat, but that was last week. I took the the mother and father-in-law out for lunch that day we went to mcdonald's so that was pretty cool too and clark man of course was along for the ride the whole way and he had a blast so that was a great day off of school and we most certainly made the most of that this week was a little different unfortunately clark had to go to school don't get me wrong i was very tempted to just pull him out for the day you know we're no strangers to missing school days particularly last year we missed god knows how many days it was a lot with all of our travels and stuff but this year, you know, I'm trying to like use those days where we actually need them. And I can easily find things for Clark Man out when we're, when I'm shopping at yard sales and stuff. And that's exactly what I did. I found some really great stuff, including a few video games. Those, those were for me. I found Donkey Kong Country Returns for the Wii for a dollar. And then I found the game uh, Dishonored that was the definitive edition or complete edition with DLC for three. There was tons of video games that I came across. My nemesis, if you guys watch the Greg's World vlogs, I have a nemesis. That's this guy that wears this shirt that says, I buy video games and he drives this white truck. And what he does is he just drives up to a place, like leaves his truck running, opens the door, runs up and asks him if they have video games. If they do, he buys them all. And if not, he just runs back to his truck and goes to the next place. Meanwhile, like I'm with my mother and father-in-law and we're, you know, casually going through all these places so I very rarely find video games this guy must not have been out so there was a bunch of stuff and I passed on a bunch of things including some Call of Duty games there were some Mortal Kombat games that I remember seeing some good quality stuff and some good prices uh, there was a Wii that I passed on there was an Xbox 360 God knows I don't need any more of those I've got like three right now that I need to like sell I haven't even tested the one I want to make a video where I, I kind of go through that whole process I thought that would be fun for a no zero days uh, so I, I, I'm skipping the consoles and mostly video games just because they don't really sell for much. Like you buy a video game for a dollar, you might get five bucks off of it. We're not at the place where that generation of games that I'm finding, like mainly everything I find is Wii, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. That stuff's not quite old enough yet to be worth something, and I really don't want to hold it until it is. Now, if you go back further, like 
PlayStation 1, GameCube, Nintendo 64, all of that stuff from like the, the 90s and early 2000s is starting to creep up there. I haven't seen a Sega Genesis. I haven't seen Super Nintendo games. I haven't seen Atari, regular Nintendo. I haven't seen any of that. That stuff's long gone at this point, which is really sucky because I would buy that stuff. But I did uh, pass on a number of video games. Got a few. My next score that I found was a really good one, Sur like surprisingly good. It was this tin that had, it was like a Monopoly tin. It said $7 on it. And I opened up inside of it. There were a couple sealed die cast cars with little Monopoly pieces. They were Monopoly branded. And there was all these little Monopoly games and little trinkets and things. And I only really wanted the cars. And I said, hey, would you be willing to sell me just these cars? And he said, two, two bucks for the cars. And I was like, well, I might as well just buy the whole thing for seven because I'm sure something on here I could sell. So I gave him seven bucks. So I get back to the car and I'm looking through and there's a ton of stuff on there. And these little games are like, miniature like travel sized board games that I think like open up you can fold them in half and stuff there's a bunch of those in there and they sell for like ten dollars a piece on eBay and then I, when I got home I ended up finding this Hasbro Monopoly branded watch and I looked that up it's still in the packaging and everything and that sells for like 20 bucks so I made out really well on that I'm going to sell everything in there on my eBay store and see what I can turn that into. So I was excited about that. And then uh, I also found a Lego set. It was Slim Pickens for Lego because we started late. Uh, we ended up leaving the house at about a quarter after eight because Clark Mann had to get off to school. We would have left like an hour earlier. But all the Lego stuff was was either not there or gone by the time we got there. But I did find a set that they wanted $16 for. It was a Black Panther set. And I was like, no, 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 no. I looked in and like bag one had been opened. This has been the story of my lego yard sale finds as of late bag one opened but not not completed and it had like a little like clothes pin sealing it shut bag two and three never even touched so bud got all excited and he goes over and asks lady about it apparently her kid had started it and determined it was too hard and then that was the end of it and uh, he ended up ultimately getting that for me for ten dollars which was great because when i brought all this stuff home that was the thing clark man was so excited about in fact it's now Saturday. It's Saturday afternoon. They're getting their haircuts now, which is a great time to podcast. It kind of worked out. Um, he was so excited about that that he started building it right away, and he finished it this morning. So that thing's already built. There's no backlog with the yard sale stuff when it comes to Clark Man. So I knew he'd be excited about that. I also got him this shirt that it's perfect for him because he's been putting hot sauce on everything that he eats, which I love to see because we're like a spicy food family. And there was a time that Clark Man was not into spicy foods at all. Now he's a hot sauce connoisseur. So I found this shirt that says awesome sauce on it. It's a red shirt with like white letters and has like a hot sauce bottle and like a hamburger and stuff on it. I was like, dude, that's perfect for him. So he was excited. I thought it was too big. It's like a size 10, but apparently that's the size that he wears. I thought he was only wearing eights, but he's, he's growing drastically. So everything was like perfect for that. And we had a great time out yesterday it was like again the whole day it was a lot of just looking a lot of just getting skunked on things but again for me a big part of it is just looking around at stuff I love that and anytime that I can find a dog to pet I'm all in in fact I fell in love with this little Jack Russell Chihuahua mix I'm usually a big dog dude but this little dog was looking like he was so desperate for attention so I went over and I started petting her and she was just the nicest thing. And the owner was totally fine with me petting it, which is, you know, I, I try not to be weird, but it is a little weird when you get down and you're petting people's dogs. Uh, but she was so sweet, little fat thing. Lady's like, oh, we don't feed her dog food. We give her steaks and pork chops and stuff. And I was thinking like, yeah, you can tell she's, she's probably about twice the weight she should be, but she was just so sweet. And that was, I didn't get anything at the yard sale, but I got a lot of pettings in. And that sometimes can be my favorite scores of the day. <laughs> so um, that was, that was their day yesterday. It was, it was really great. So that was kind of like the highlights of my week uh, with, with the yard sailing. I did have, like, to, to counter that, you know, that was, like, my high. I did have a low, though, last week. And it happened literally right after I recorded this episode that night. Uh, and it was, uh, the worst part of this is, is it was entirely my fault. I messed up. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. Well, I guess I'll tell you the story as I discovered it. Friday morning the day we were going out to that initial yard sale, I woke up at like three o'clock in the morning and I was like, oh man, I, I don't know if I was having a dream. I think it was one of the situations where I was having a dream. I talked about this last week. I have like these dreams where I'm encountering some type of difficulty or thing I have to overcome or figure out. And instead of doing that in the dream and working at it, I wake myself up so I don't have to endure it. And I think that happened to me. So I was awake 
And I was like, well, I guess I'll go downstairs on the couch and just kind of hang out, get on my iPad, and maybe I'll fall back asleep. So I go down there, and as I'm laying there, I hear this commotion outside, this like screaming. And I'm like, what is that? So I open up the, the door to the deck, and I yell. And then I keep hearing it, and I'm like, oh, God, it's the chickens. I noticed that the, the door was open, and that's where I made a mistake. That afternoon, I went out there, and I was feeding and watering the chickens, and I went in and got the eggs and did all this stuff. And we have an automatic door that opens and closes every morning and night. And I fully rely on that. And it did its job. But we have another another door that I used before that's still in there. That's the one that I opened to check the eggs. And when you know it, like an idiot, I didn't close it. So I go out there. I, I run out. with I grab some shoes and run out there. And there's feathers all over the chicken yard. It's the worst feeling you can have as a chicken owner. And I find Lemon, who's our like tan chick. And I see her kind of standing in the corner. She's like, like frightened. So I pick her up and put her in the coop. And I look in the coop and I see three other chickens, but then I hear uh, another chicken screaming in the, like in the neighbor's driveway that runs along the backside of the chicken coop. So I go in, I grab a flashlight and I go out around the house and I run down there and it's Emily laying there in the, the neighbor's driveway. She's still alive, but I pick her up and she's soaked, not in blood, thankfully, but like saliva. So I was like, Oh God, something big was here. So I take her back and I put her in and I do a head count. And luckily, everybody's there. Clactus is there. Uh, Woody's there. Broody's there. But Tom, my favorite chicken, Tom Brown, who Clark named, he's he's gone. And those all those feathers that were in the, the chicken yard, those were Tom's. And I was just so devastated. I was like, oh, my gosh. It's like one thing when it, when it happens. Like, I prepare myself for this because I know they're outdoor animals. They're chickens. You can't get too attached to them because any kinds of number of things can happen. You have things outside all the time like that. And I've had plenty of chicken attacks before. I've lost lots of them I, it, for, for any number of reasons. But we've been on a good run. And um, that run came to an end because I messed up. I left that freaking door open. And all it takes is one mistake like that to have a predator come. And I, I come to find out that it was a fox because I have a camera out there. I turned the motion on it off because it's like it, chickens always trigger it. So I had the motion off. But like the next night I turned it on and first there was a um, raccoon or a possum. A possum walked by, but then a fox. And every night since then I've had, I've been closing the door every night since then. I've been seeing this fox out there. He hangs out for about 10 to 15 minutes walking around, checking out. The, the coop is super secure when you have the door closed, but it's this fox out there. And, uh, I, the battle damage to my other chickens, like, uh, lemon, I didn't think was going to make it. She was, she was like really not doing well. Just, she didn't even come out of the coop. She was just standing in there. So I brought her inside. I ended up getting this little dog crate at last week's yard sales. And I, I kept her in there and, uh, I was like, dude, she's not going to make it. There were flies kind of around her and her, uh, just not to get graphic here. And maybe I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, like her, her poo was like a greenish yellow. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. But when you know it, like as the days went by, she seemed to be fine and she seemed to be like doing better. And one day it was really nice and sunny outside. So I put her outside and she just started acting like the rest of the chickens again. She's out there eating food, drinking water, giving them snacks. She's eating that. She's eating corn. And I'm like, oh, so thankful. So she definitely got bad. There were her feathers were everywhere out there. And Emily, the one that I rescued from the driveway that I ran out and got out of the driveway. Thank God she was screaming. Uh, she has no feathers in the back of her neck. Like if she stretches her head out, like to peck at something, she's completely like skinned. Like all it is is just, just like no feathers. It's just chicken neck. Like imagine a chicken that you would get at the store. If it's still at its neck, just a really long, thin, like tan piece there. I'm like, oh my gosh. But had Emily not screamed like that, and to take it back even further, I truly believe things happen for a reason. Had I not woke up from that dream or whatever happened that night and gone downstairs and been awake, I would have never heard Emily screaming or clucking or whatever you want to call it when a chicken is getting attacked. And I would have not been able to run out there and yell, which I think the fox just dropped her and then took off running. And had they not dropped her right on the neighbor's driveway, instead went down in the woods and dropped her, who knows if I would have been able to find her. So Emily doing that honestly saved the rest of those chickens because obviously they already got Tom. He was gone, just feathers. And then they were going after Lemon. And then they got Emily and took her out of the chicken yard. 
And, you know, luckily she got saved, but had she not done that, I wouldn't even have known. I would have never known that was happening out there. And who knows that Fox could have came back and got every single one of those. It's like, that's the frustrating thing because it's like, dude, you already got a chicken. You got enough food. Tom, like, I hate to say it, but like, there's enough meat on Tom that that Fox would have been fine. But it's like, you know, they just kept going and kept coming back. So Emily saved all my chickens lives and I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful I only lost one, but it sucks that it has to be like my favorite chicken. He was so, or she, I keep calling him a boy because Clark named him Tom Brown. He was such a friendly, lovey chicken. And it just like shows you that like, like sometimes the, the world is against you, you know? It had to be Tom. Not that I'd want to sacrifice any of them. In fact, Emily is the one that's the nastiest of all of them. She's like the, the alpha chicken who is like kind of mean to low level ones, but she's the one that saved them. So I have this new appreciation. And a, a really funny thing about it is she, like, I, I feel like the chickens are now bonded together even more. She's not as aggressive as she was. I think she's been brought down or she's down a peg and they're all seemingly like together now. And I really like that. Um, but, you know, this is one of those things where I was kind of on the fence about getting more chickens. I usually like to have about eight chickens or so. That's that's a good number out there. And, like, after this happened, I was like, you know, we've been talking about getting more chickens because these chickens are about three years old now. Chicken lifespan, living to old age, I think maybe six years, I think I read online. Not many of them make it that long uh, in, in most cases. I had a chicken make it to, uh, I think, how old was she? Like, uh, old hen last year was like nine or so maybe. She lived the longest out of all of them. In fact, I think she was born in 2013. I think she was like eight or nine when she when she passed away. And that kind of takes me to, um, well, I guess I'll say I ordered more chickens because I, I would like to replenish the flock. And they just bring me so much happiness. There was this part where I was like, you know, maybe this is this like risk and this heartache that you have when these things happen. Is it worth the trouble? And ultimately, just like having a dog or a cat or any other animal that you know probably isn't going to outlive you, I think ultimately it is because I, I just love them. I love them so much when I go out there and I feed them and their little sounds they make. And it, it gives me like, I don't want to say a, like a purpose in life, but it, there is a, um, I, I like being the caretaker of these chickens. And I like like collecting eggs and I like giving them the scraps and we have like fruits and stuff. And I love giving them corn, their little treats and all that. So I ended up getting, oh, speaking of caretakers mellow cats at the back door i think she wants some cat food just a little bit mellow i got six new chickens so we're gonna have 11 which is a full house out there but i think it's gonna be very exciting we ended up ordering them from meyer hatchery i called all the places around us like tractor supply and there's this other place called calico creek and none of them have chickens at this time of the year but i didn't want to wait until spring because i was like well let's just get them started now and i thought it would help uh, relieve the heartache of losing our favorite chicken by getting new ones because Clark was devastated. He's like, he even made a comment, something like God's against him. And I'm like, dude, I'm, we're, we can't have this. We got to, we got to like cheer. We got to bring the morale back. And I thought, you know, if we're raising these baby chicks out there, that'll be something that'll help him forget that we lost Tom. You know, and only I kind of felt responsible too, because again, this was 100% my fault. I'm the one that left the door open. It wasn't a mechanical failure on the automatic door. It was purely my negligence because I opened that door and then I, I did what I needed to do. And then I like was cleaning up watermelon rinds. I took them down, threw them away. And then I think when I came back, like I completely forgot about that door. And maybe nine times out of 10, that would have been fine. I would have come out there next morning and be like, oh my gosh, I left that door open. But all it takes, like, like I said, is one hungry fox. And you get ruined. And that's that's what happens. Years of raising these chickens and stuff. And one night, it's gone. And I'm sure if you own any livestock or chickens, you probably can relate. Because something like this has probably happened to you. But we got new chickens coming in the mail. Uh, it's interesting because they're going to be born on October 2nd. They know like what day they're going to be born. And they ship them in the mail. You might think that's crazy. But I did this once before. And they put like a little heat pad in there in some cases, if, depending on the weather. And they ship them and the chickens are okay in there for a day or so because apparently like they eat the yolk or whatever that they're, they're housed in when they hatch and they're good for a day or two. So there it's enough time to ship them in the mail. Not a great start to your life, obviously, but the, they go to the post office, post office calls you and they're like, Hey, we got your chickens here. And then you walk in and you hear this peep, 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 peep. And then you bring them home and then you take care of them from there. Uh, they do refund you if any chicken dies in the mail or if, if any chickens die shortly thereafter, or like uh, as, as it sometimes happens, but I got six in the event that we do lose one or two. Cause that is possible. In fact, Emily should have had a twin, 
but that was Raf, and he died shortly after we got him from Tractor Supply. So we would have had another one out there. But these ones, Cody and Clark helped me pick out, and they're all very different and all very interesting chickens that I feel like will each be a little, like, have their own little character. And Clark is committed to naming them all, and it's going to be a lot of fun to do that, and I think make up for this. And the nice thing is we'll have chickens that are, like, halfway through their lifespan and then new chickens, so we'll be able to rotate, and we'll, like, always have, like, eggs coming from them. So that's good. I say all this, and again, some of this, like, may be disturbing for you to hear, and obviously it sucks for everyone. Even you as a listener, I think, can probably relate to losing uh, an animal that you care about. I think anybody can relate to that. But you won't be seeing any of this on Greg's world. And you might be thinking, well, Greg, why not? Like, isn't that a part of life? And in my perspective, it absolutely is. But last time that we had a chicken that was sick, which was Old Hen, the one that lived a super long life, and she was on kind of like her last legs, literally. I got, when I made a video about that, there was a part of a video, it wasn't like dedicated to that, but there was a part of a video, I've got a lot of flack from it from more than a few people that were upset that I showed a, a sick chicken or a chicken that was going to die. And like, even people are like, Greg, you really need to like check yourself. You need to hire an editor to like review this before you put it out there. And I can, I guess I can respect that. Like there, I know there are kids that watch and maybe kids that love, you know, love these chickens like I do. And they, they're featured in videos and to see Tom's feathers all over the chicken yard, not necessarily something that I want to put into their lives. But again, it, it is life. It is reality. Death is a part of life. Uh, and then I think there, there's that aspect. And then I think there's another aspect of it where people go to YouTube to escape reality. You have enough going on in your life and things to deal with that you don't need the burden of my life. Like maybe even this podcast a little bit, you know, like maybe this podcast is like, oh, I just want to hear Greg talk about all the great stuff that's going on and uh, all of his hopes and dreams and how he's succeeding at all these things. Well, sometimes that doesn't happen, right? And I've always been a guy it like, shares it all. I feel like you have to share the the reality of life. This is an Instagram where you just take your best photo and you put it out there. This is my day to day life. But in this case, I was like, all right, like my instinct was be like, well, Friday morning, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to say like all of what I'm telling you right now. But then I was like, well, I'm going to hear from those people. I'm going to hear like, Greg, we don't want to see your, your chickens all roughed up and that is this chicken going to die. And this chicken has no feathers left and there's just a massacre. You know, I, I, I guess I caved. I caved to those people. And I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but it was a decision in the time that seemed like the right thing to do. So ultimately, like, we still have five chickens out there. Most people that don't listen to this may not even notice that, that Tom is gone. Uh, maybe, you know, I, 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 I would like to bring this up, but I don't know. I haven't really talked to Cody about her, her thoughts on what I should do with this. It's just kind of, I'm just going with how I feel. And I don't want to get people upset. In fact, like even this podcast, I was debating whether to share it here because it could be the, the you know, same people that tune into Greg's world that don't want to know the harsh realities that are life. Because like I said, death is a part of life. And if you want to shield yourself or your kids from that, that's fine. But that's not reality. And when this happened, like when Clark got up that morning, how I responded to it as a parent wasn't to not tell him about it. Like, this isn't something you can hide. I mean, I can hide it from the, the general public, I suppose, but like eventually Clark's going to go out there and wonder where's Tom. So I explained to him, I was like, I messed up yesterday, buddy. I left the, the door open and all of this stuff happened. And he was upset. He started crying. And, but I was like, yeah, buddy, I'm so sorry, but th this is, this is just what happened. So we went out that morning and, you know, we, we looked around and did a head count and everything after it got light out. And luckily, everyone else seemed to be okay, with the exception of Lemon, who is now fine. And Emily was was Emily was actually doing great. I was like, wow! Literally picked her up out of the out of the driveway. I can't believe that she she lived. That was that was a miracle, and I'm thankful for that. But yeah, I, I explained to him like this is what happens. You know, you sometimes bad things happen in life, and sometimes bad things like are are going to happen. But it's how we respond to them that's the important thing. And I guess as a viewer. Or if you had a, a kid that was watching and they, they saw this occur, that would be a great teaching tool or a life lesson. And maybe I could be the deliverer of, of such lessons, but I don't know if that's necessarily my responsibility. And I don't know how, I don't know if it's right to force that upon someone 
at a time when it's not the right time necessarily, because you just don't know. You don't know who's watching. But I try to lead by example. I try to be a role model. And I think ultimately it would be good if I took responsibility for this publicly, like I am here, and to explain what happened and show it all. But I think most people, they just want to like, they don't want that. They don't want that in their life. I'm curious to see what you have to say about that, though. Let me, let me know your thoughts on sharing things that maybe aren't something that people necessarily want to see or necessarily go to YouTube to watch. Because that's like my perspective on it from a, a creator who can read comments and things from people that have seen things. But I guess you probably have your life perspective on it, too. And it probably depends where you're at in your life and what you've experienced in your life. But it'll be interesting as a maybe a follow up conversation on uh, ne next week's episode. So that was my low of the week. Uh, middle thing of the week, I guess. Uh, we got our house pressure washed. That was kind of cool. Uh, we had like, after a while, we had like on the north side of the house, it doesn't get much sun. We had like green algae and stuff growing on there. And I really wanted that taken care of. So I called around to a bunch of places. And just like any other time that I try to get work done here at the house, it is incredibly difficult to get anyone to do anything. People don't want to work anymore. I don't necessarily believe in that. But I do think that there is a lack of competent service people that do jobs for a living. And I always say like, if I just pick something to do, like pressure washing, for example, I honestly think I would have the most successful business at it because one, I would make sure I do a good job. That would be a priority for me. But two, I also have the business sense, which I think some of these guys lack. Like some of these people are really good at doing the thing they do, but they're bad at calling people back or doing estimates or like being like on top of the, the business side of things. I could do both of those things well. And I think if you do that side of the things, even better than you do the service side of it, like if you're really good with people, if you can communicate well, if you can show up on time, if you can like call people back, make appointments, if you can do all of that well, as long as you just do your job and you're courteous, everything falls into place. And the one guy that called me back, he was like that. All the other people, I, I tried calling left messages. I literally like left messages saying like, hey, I need my house pressure washed. Uh, give me a call back whenever you get a chance. I'd love to have you come out, take a look at it. Don't even bother calling back at all. Maybe it's because they're too busy. Maybe there's not enough people that do it in the area. I don't know. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to keep harassing these people to come out. Like if, if it's not important enough for you to call me back and be like, yeah, I'll come out and do an estimate two weeks from now, whatever. Like this wasn't an emergency. Fine. But the one guy that did call me back, he came right out like that weekend, took a look at it, gave me an estimate. And I was, he was very polite, very kind, shook my hand, all of that stuff. He did exactly what I would do. And I was like, okay, this is my guy. And the price was pretty competitive other than the, the driveway. I felt like he was a little high in the driveway, but then I thought, you know, for the money that I would be spending to pressure wash the driveway, like obviously I don't want to get up on the side of the house and pressure wash like two stories. Like if our house is single story, I would just do the whole thing myself. No problem. But two stories, I get a little, I don't like going up on heights and things like that. So let him do that. But then I thought instead of him doing the driveway, why don't I use that money that he was going to charge me to pressure wash a driveway one time and go out and get a nice pressure washer or at least like a, a decent one. So that's what I did. I went to Lowe's, spent 250 bucks on a pressure washer, and I pressure washed some spots in my driveway that I wanted done. The driveway doesn't look great. Uh, it, it's it's 30 years old at this point. Obviously, I don't want to like tear it out and put a new one in because I think doing a, a concrete driveway that's the size of ours, if I had to guess, would probably be like $15,000, maybe $20,000 these days. So we're going to rock it, but the house looks great. Driveway's good. And now I have a pressure washer that I can use for anything. We have other concrete. We've got, um, you know, things along the side of the house. We've got these bricks that go along our, um, uh, what, do you, what would you call that? Flower beds, I guess, or like kind of trim around our house. So I can use that for almost anything. And it's almost like one of those things. And I'm going to butcher the, uh, the statement here, but it's like, give a man a fish, he eats for one day, teach a man to fish, he fishes for a lifetime, or eats fish for a lifetime. It's kind of what I'm looking like with a pressure washer. I could have had that done, and then two years from now, I'm like, hey, I need you to come do the driveway again. But now it's like, hey, I can do this anytime I want. If I want to pressure wash that, I want to clean the bikes, I want to do anything, like my kayak needs pressure wash, because that's kind of getting grody, I can do all that myself with the money that I would have spent. So, and I don't mind it, because it's kind of satisfying. In fact, going back to Clark Man, he came home and wanted to try it out, and he loved it. He's like, this is a funny part. I think I might have got this on video, so you'll get to hear it again. But he's like, you know, being a pressure washer is so much fun. It's like being a firefighter without the danger. 
without having to go into a burning building or saving people, you just get to like be a firefighter. And I was like, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. And it is satisfying to do it when you see like the dirt coming off. If you want to go down a rabbit hole, and I don't recommend this because you may never come back out, look up pressure washing videos on YouTube. It's a, it's a fun thing to watch, especially if it's like something really dark and filthy. I even got around to watching this lady that was like fixing up tombstones and cleaning those and stuff. And that's fun to watch too. Seal coating driveways. I think I shared that once before. Oh my gosh, it's so satisfying. Anyways, I'm now a pressure washer. I have a decent one. Put that in the garage and I'm happy with that. Other things Clark Man's getting into outside of pressure washing though. Last weekend, he started watching these YouTube tutorials on how to draw things. And he was obsessed with this. He started drawing everything and anything, like various characters from uh, Nintendo. And he drew the Luffy from One Piece, which we finished this week. I'll talk about in a little bit. And he was just going to town, like filling up his whole sketchbook with all these drawings. And I thought, dude, that is so cool. And like I was hyping him up on this because I think that is truly the power of YouTube. You can turn YouTube into whatever you want it to be, but to go on there and to watch things that better you as an artist or become more creative or inspire you in some way, I think is the ultimate ability of a platform like this. You could do that or you could watch like these little garbage shows that he sometimes tunes into that are like kids stuff. That's just like, there's no storyline. There's no like character development. It's just like these, these time sinks. And it's like, when I see him watching that, I'm like, yeah, that's what I want you to get into, man. Uh, so he was doing that. And then I also, he wanted to do a stop motion for his channel. And he, his last time he did a stop motion, he shot a whole video of this thing. And then he was cutting it. Like when, like he'd do something, take his hands out, do it again, take his hands out. And then he was cutting this video. And I'm like, they have stop motion apps where you could, you know, do all that without all the crazy editing that you have to do. So he was like, okay. And I downloaded it for him on his iPad. And then he started going nuts making these stop motions. He probably made 10 stop motions last weekend, having a blast with it. So it was really rewarding for me as a dad to see him being creative in the world of uh, drawing and stop motion. Cause I guess there's like this thing with me that really wants him to like maybe take that path of creativity. And, uh, I, the least I can do or the all, all I can really do is and try to encourage it the most I can because you got the nature and you got the nurture. I'll handle the nurture the best that I can, but there is some nature. And if he has interest in that, I'm all in just like anything else that he's into. So that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, as for a watch attack, as I mentioned, we finished one piece. We had two episodes left. We finished that out. Amazing show. Even if you don't like anime, if you're into watching like somewhat kind of a weird type show live action that has some really uh, likable characters with some crazy adventure storyline that almost feels like a video game in a way that there's these various boss battles and villains and stuff. They're all pirates, of course. Uh, give one piece a shot. Watch like one episode. You're going to know instantly if you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you can blame me. You only lost like maybe an hour worth of your time give it a shot. But we love One Piece and I'm trying to figure out what's next because the next One Piece episode, it's they're confirming that they're going to continue this the show. They have the next season already done, but there's a writer strike right now, of course, and then they said it'd be 18 to 24 months before the next season comes out. So assuming that the writer strike ends soon, we're looking at 2 years. And to think about the prospect of Clark Man being like 10 or 11 years old when the next One Piece comes out is kind of kind of crazy. So I'm kind of kind of bummed about that but i'm thinking about maybe having us watch clone wars i think that would be kind of cool so maybe we'll we'll take that path and we'll clone war it up or maybe rebels i think clone wars I, i'm just i want to see that for myself and i think clark would enjoy it greatly uh one last thing before we get into listener feedback my thought of the week which i'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to take one quick break here i'm going to get a drink and i'm also going to feed the cat because she is giving me the biggest stare down that you could ever imagine I'll be right back. Now that all is right with the world, my thought of the week, or possibly rant of the week, depending on how you perceive this, eBay feedback. It should be automatic. And I say this because I started a new eBay account, Brickitech store, if you want to go buy any of my stuff. And I've sold six items so far as of the recording of this. And I have exactly zero feedback. And that frustrates me. I think this is maybe an unpopular opinion, Maybe not. I think as a buyer, once you pay for something, you should automatically get positive feedback. It should, like your end of the bargain is done. You paid for the item. You're done. Positive feedback. The seller has nothing else to say about you. Positive feedback. As a seller, 
if you make a sale and you ship it through eBay and there's a tracking number and it shows as delivered, you should get automatic positive feedback from the buyer. Now, the buyer should have the option to override that in the event that there's something wrong with the shipment or the item or something goes wrong. They should be able to go, go in and override that and say, no, actually this is negative or neutral or whatever. But if both parties complete their end of the agreement, one is to buy something, which as soon as you buy it, like that's the end of you as a buyer. And if the seller sends it, which is what their job is, both sides should receive a positive feedback that says, yes, they both did what they're supposed to do. Because my problem is, as a seller, and I've had lots of sales that I've made on my other eBay account where the buyer never leaves feedback, and I'm sure I've bought things where the seller hasn't left feedback, it's one of those things where if you just go on there for a single item and you're not an eBayer per se, you just get your thing and then like that's the end of it. You don't have a reason to go back to eBay later unless you're like a person that's on there all the time and you know buying and selling and stuff like I am. Like you go on, you're like, oh, I need this thing. Let me check eBay. Okay, there it is. Let me buy it. Okay, boom, it comes later. Feedback should just be automatic. That's my thoughts on it. I'm curious to see what some of you guys, I'm sure a lot of people here have experience with feed or with eBay, maybe not with feedback if you're one of those buyers that bought one of my things. Uh, but I'm thinking about in this particular case, like messaging all of the buyers and just saying, hey, I noticed that your item was delivered and it, everything. if everything is good, would you mind going on and giving me feedback, uh, letting eBay and other potential buyers know that I'm a stand-up guy? Because I've sold six items, I have zero feedback. So it's like, can people trust me or not? I don't know. I've sold six things. Did anyone get their thing? Supposedly they did, but it's just, I don't know, it's kind of frustrating. You know what I mean? So that's my thought. If you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear it. But speaking of your thoughts, man, you guys were a, a talkative bunch last week. I'm really thankful to hear back. Uh, my question of the week last week, which uh, isn't necessarily a thing, but a thing it was, is what's your dream job? talked about mine being an over the road truck driver and uh you know documenting that journey going places across the road sharing all of the the things that I would I would film along the way like crazy drivers truck stop tours uh hauling loads maybe have a GoPro on top of the truck you could see all around it I think that'd be so cool <laughs> life goals until then I'll be playing American Truck Simulator on my computer and kind of doing the same thing uh, only virtually but you guys have some actual dream jobs that I'm sure you could you could pull off a lot better than I could pull off being a truck driver. Starting with Janelle. She says, my dream job would be to run a Montessori school. I knew she was going to say this. Infant through eighth grade. Why? Because any kids after eighth grade are terrible. No, I'm just kidding. She says, because I think children learn best when it's hands-on with all their senses. I also hate worksheets and book-based learning. I also hate standardized tests and spending months on teaching to the test. You would not like public school. I'll say that, Janelle. Uh, but yeah, I, you've mentioned these before when I was talking about the potential of homeschooling Clark, man. Which as of right now, even though so his school kind of does, does follow the things that you hate, uh, I love the social aspect that he's getting there. He's making friends. He has kids in the bus. He's learning how to work with other kids. He's learning like rules and how to follow them. And I'm sure you can obviously do all that through Montessori, but... I think it's good for where he's at right now. As he gets older, will that my opinion on that change? Potentially. Will I feel like he's not being challenged enough at school? Potentially. Will he be better off just doing online learning or or and doing whatever else he wants to do during the day? Potentially. But for right now, we're in a good spot. He's got a great teacher this year. Uh, and and like she he complains because she's like running with an iron fist. And I like that. She sends things home, like what they're learning this week. They've got spelling tests that she sends the stuff home. She, she's like, she has 20 minutes of reading they have to do every night. And it's a complete departure from what last year looked like for him when I was really kind of like not loving the whole school scene, particularly when they were harassing us about having him out of school and he was having experiences that no other kids were having at the time. I think this year is going really well. And this is going to be the year where we kind of made our decision. And so far, so good. We're only a month in, but... Man, they're they're doing a great job. So, I I do I do see the the positives and and negatives in 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 public education. But for right now, thumbs up for me. Next one comes from my friend Jim, who says, "I thought maybe CTO or CIO of TLG would be my dream job, but then I would have to deal with the release day crashes and complaints. No bueno. Will someone just pay me to build Lego? Is that YouTube? Yeah, I mean you." You could, you could become a Lego YouTuber. If I can do it, I would say that literally anyone can. Um, I don't know what TLG is. I looked that up. I'm like, what's TLG? There's so many things that have the uh, the uh, 
letters TLG in them, you're going to have to elaborate. It sounds like something with computers, release day crashes and complaints. So I'm thinking it's some type of computer thing where you uh, put out like a program and then people are like, oh, this, this is terrible, Jim. What'd you do? I don't know. Either that or you're like a, maybe, maybe TLG is a, you say release day crashes. Maybe you are a guy that makes cars and then you put the car out and then people crash the car when you make it. I don't think that's the case, but I don't know. You're going to have to, you're going to have to tell me what TLG is. Probably people out there know. Next one comes from Sarah says my dream job be working with little kids because they're cute and playing with them is fun. I agree. I never considered myself a, like a little kid dude. Like when my nephews were Clark's age, I wasn't like heavily involved in them. They lived just down the street, but it wasn't like a thing that I got involved. I don't know if I wasn't at the right place in my life for that. But once you have a kid, hanging out and being with other kids and even your own kid is like an awesome thing. And I, I'm like a big kid at heart as it is. So like, I love it. I love ki like younger kids. Like they're, they're just so fun and like so positive and, and great. I'm, I'm sure there's exceptions to that. And, you know, obviously once they get older, just like, uh, you want to know why I deal with kids up through eighth grade, maybe that's where things change. But uh, little kids are so great and they're so sweet. I think being like a kindergarten teacher would be a lot of fun, although chaotic, maybe first, second, third grade. I think cl kids Clark's age are still awesome and like all kinds of fun. I don't know when that switches over though. Some of the parents out there probably know, like, is it, is it fourth grade, fifth grade? Tell me where I, where I'm going to like start experiencing these problems. Does it, when they become a teenager, middle school, where is, where are things going to go completely wrong for us? Don't tell me, but you can tell me if you need to. Next one comes from uh, Samuel. He says, hey, Greg, just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the whole dream job question. I'm so proud of you guys for coming back with some responses to this. It's always scary when I throw these questions out to you and like, I don't know if anyone's going to reply. It's like throwing a party and you got all the snacks and the cake set up and you open the doors and you're looking down, you know, looking down the street, down the hallway or whatever. <laughs> Nobody's there, but man, it's great. He says, uh, for about a decade now, I've had a dream of becoming a sales consultant for a Toyota dealer. However, as as of late, I've been questioning that dream and instead of thinking going into finance or engineering career. Please keep in mind I'm a junior in high school. I realize you're a big financial guy and even worked in finance for a while, so I wanted to ask if finance is a good path to go down. I'm always intrigued in numbers, especially economical, so I thought it would be a good job for me. Nevertheless, thank you for an hour of your time. Well, I'll try to make this reach an hour. Might have to include the part where I went out and fed the cat, possibly, but yes, you sound like you would be inclined to do the financial side of things. In fact, if you wanted to get real fancy, you could combine your love of Toyota and being a sales consultant to the financial side of working for Toyota. There's a guy. You could be the guy that the salesman keeps having to go back and forth to to make the deals work. You know, the, the BS that they do where you go and buy a car and you're like, I'm willing to pay this. And they're like, oh, let me go talk to my guy. You could be the guy that they, that they mess around with. You could do that end of it. And that was kind of sort of like what I was doing. I was doing personal loans, but that's where it kind of lost me because I'm not a huge believer in debt. I'm, I don't, I feel like debt burdens people, which is an absolute fact. And I didn't like the idea of furthering that, even though the people that I was helping felt like they were being helped. I wanted to be on the other end of the, the financial spectrum. I wanted to be like, hey, you got a bunch of debt. Let me help you get out of this and let's help you create a better life. That's what I would want to do. So my job ended up kind of like uh, sucking my soul because I was going against something that I believed in. But if you're a Toyota dude or a vehicle guy and you want to do finance too, you can combine those so easily. But uh, you, there's so much you can do. You could become an accountant. You could do so much with finance. I think it would be a valid thing to go into. Being a sales consultant, I think it could be a rewarding job, but boy, I think that'd be a lot of stress too, working on commission and trying to sell cars to people, especially now that a lot of companies I think are going to start going towards the Tesla model where you get online, this is the price, you can either pay it or not pay it, and we'll let you know when you can pick up your car. I think the whole like dealership thing is, I don't think people like it. I don't think it's a good experience for anyone, and, and I hate to generalize, but When's the last time that you were like, boy, I'm so looking forward to going to the, the car dealership to go chat with the salesman there and have him get me a good deal. You're at odds with each other. It's a battle and people don't want to do that. And it's weird that that exists that way when in a lot of other cases, like when you go to buy something, it's not like that. Like you don't go to uh, the movie theater 
And when the person says, can I help you? You're like, I'd like a ticket to see the, this new movie, but I'm really only willing to pay $6. Can you do any better on the price? And then they're like, well, let me go talk to my manager and see if we can get you in for like, I'll, we can get you seven. And you're like, well, how about six fifty? Like, it just seems crazy, right? Why, why are car deals like this? I can understand used cars in some cases because it's, you know, it's like, okay, I need to put new tires in this. There's a, a tear in the seat, the, the, you know, there's, I don't, whatever there's, there's a crack in the windshield. There's some negotiation opportunities there, but new cars shouldn't be negotiated. It should just be the price. Maybe dealerships like to hear that. I don't know, but like their price shouldn't be inflated in any way. It should be, this is what we are selling it for. I don't know, but yeah, I, I would recommend a job in finance. You can do so much with that kind of degree. And the nice thing is you got a lot of time to think about it too. You're only a junior. You got so much time and it's nice that you're, you're contemplating these things already. Speaking of younger people watching, Eggstream, who I've met in real life mobile times. Man, my nose is itchy today. Holy smokes. If you're watching this this uh, video, my nose is itching. Does that mean something? I think if your hand itches, it mean, or your palm itches, it means you're going to get money. What does an itchy nose mean? I don't know. I, <laughs> it's bothering the heck out of me. Sorry. Any, we should end this. Anyways, <laughs> next one comes from Eggstream, who says, Hey, Greg, hope you had a good and productive week. I personally think you don't need to upgrade your mic. It sounds good already good. Yeah, I got some comments in the mic. I was thinking about upgrading this. I guess we, uh, I'll wait to give you my final thoughts on it until after we get through all the mic comments. He says, it already sounds good. It takes two sounds like fun. When you beat that game, you should try Portal 2 co-op. I was wondering what our next game's going to be, which is very similar to It Takes Two. I actually own it for the Nintendo Switch. I got a great deal on it. And Clark played a little bit of it. I didn't. I was going to look up if it was co-op or not. That would be lovely for us. If you don't know what Portal is, it's like a puzzle game where you have a portal gun and you shoot in like a portal into a wall. And then you shoot another portal in another place and you go through the one portal like a hole and then you come out of the other spot. So it's like a way of trying to get through whatever it is you're trying to get through. And it's, it's kind of cool. He says, my dream job would be, would be an entrepreneur and have a bunch of little jobs like mealworm farmer or yard sale, eBay flipper. I know that's a stretch, not necessarily. Uh, plus a few more because I could do a lot of different things instead of just one like French fry guy or popcorn cart guy. And I could have more free time to do other things. I love that. I don't think you necessarily need to go work for someone to have a career. I think you can do a lot of things. And I, you said, it sounds like a stretch to be a yard sale, eBay flipper. Look at some of these people that do the YouTube videos of them doing that. Some of them make more money on YouTube than they do through their job. Like they're a YouTuber that shares that experience. <laughs> and, um, the rest of it is just like icing on the cake. So you could totally do that. Um, you could be a renaissance man of sorts, someone that does a little bit of everything and has little odd jobs and stuff. I don't think there's a, a definite path for anyone like that everyone has to follow, but everyone has their own unique things that you could get into. And I, I'm totally with that. And if you want to be a French fry guy, do that for a little bit. And you want to do something else, do that for a little bit. I think the idea of a, uh, a person staying loyal to a company is a thing of the past. I think lots of people are moving around trying things and seeing what works for you. The worst thing you could do, I think, is get tied into something that then you feel stuck into because that's what you've done for so long and you're afraid to make a move to something that would make you happy because you make good money. That's the worst. That is the worst. In fact, I worked with a lady before at my in my old life, at my old job, that you know, that was kind of her case. Like her husband made good money and she made decent money too. She didn't have a college education. She had worked there for 20 years or something like that. And she was doing really well, but she was miserable and she wanted to switch jobs or do something else. And it, like, had they been more financially responsible, like they were the type to always have a new car every year and they had a camper and did all this stuff, like all of those things, like the, the debt hole that you get sucked into, all those things were like, in my opinion, keeping her at her job like had they not had a camper had they had she driven a car for more than a year she was a toyota driver too they had to have a new car all the time it's like dude toyotas are made to last ask ask sam you could be driving an old car and had if you don't need to make that car payment maybe you don't need to work full-time anymore you could go do a part-time job doing something you love your husband makes good money like your whole life could be different and the only reason you're trapped into where you're trapped in is because of decisions you've made and the fear of something else why not take a pay cut if it would bring you happiness? Is money everything? No. Why, why live your life that way? I think, it's, I think it's a fate worse than death to do something for a living that you're miserable doing. I think it would just be, I'd rather be homeless. I'd rather live on the streets and beg for, for crumbs. You know, I, I'd rather anything than, than be miserable in my life. 
And when you spend that much time doing something that you hate, it, it can have such a terrible effect on you. So uh, I, it's easy for me to say, I suppose, because I was able to escape that. But I escaped it with not much of a safety net. My wife had a job. I, was making a little, I wasn't making as much money on YouTube as I was making at my job. But I was like, dude, this is what I love. And I'd rather be passionate about something and have it not be successful than to exist in a life that I am like this. And I, it's, it's granted me so much what the time with Clark Mann and the ability to pursue all of these interests that I have has been incredible. And I know some people probably use me as like a, um, uh, like a guide guiding light towards maybe what they want to do. And I truly believe I'm going to give you my, my pitch that I always try to give you. If you have a hobby or an interest or something out there, which I'm sure you do, there is a potential to have a YouTube channel doing that if you want to do that end of it. But the thing is, like your passion almost has to be YouTube as well because it takes so much work to get any traction at all. And if you don't like video editing or putting yourself out there or whatever the case is, you're never going to make it. Now the cat's up here. Are you fed? I think she's good. <laughs> Anyways, there's my pitch to become a YouTuber. I try to put that on everybody, uh, but it, there's very few people that will, one, do it, and two, stick with it. That's the, the hardest thing. Uh, speaking of YouTubers, a guy that I enjoy watching, Mike at the Cool Factor, he says, hello, fellow camera nerd. I definitely watch more video gear YouTube content than Lego, so you're not alone. Tell you what, get the Shure SM7B, that's the microphone I was looking at, $400 plus $100 for the, the thing to make it sound good. And your podcasting needs will be the, the last microphone you'll ever buy. You just can't go better. For audio, I did a similar thing. I sold all audio gear I had got myself uh, $1,000 dialogue microphone, Sennheiser MKH50. This is literally the last studio mic for me to ever buy. Buy once and forget it, like if, if you're looking long-term. So there's somebody that says I should buy it. We've got more people though that say I shouldn't, uh, including Brixar, also a YouTuber, a guy that has stuck with it and makes great content. He says, I don't think you need a new microphone, but you got to do what works for you. As far as Hobby Lobby, or Hoblob, as I like to call it, and I find out that one of my viewers calls it Hobster Lobster. Try not calling it that from now on. Uh, he says, I like the store, but I've only uh, been there a couple times in the last few years. I used to go several times a month, but they got rid of the daily 40% off one item coupon. I guess they had too many people like me that just bought one item. You know, I remember back to your videos where you were getting like these display cases, and I'm thinking that that's where you were getting them at, because you were talking about getting like 40% off of those. That could be could be wrong, though. He also gave his dream job, maybe the best dream job of all. He says, uh, sleep research. That would be my dream job. Getting paid to sleep. Does it get any better than that? I have a dream job for Jabbo, aka Brixar, though, and his my dream job for him, as much as you can put a dream job on someone, I want him to be the owner and curator of the Lego Museum. I want him to take all of his stuff, put it in the museum, and I just want him to take people on tours there and talk about how much he loves all the things that he has and allow people to see it all. That's what I picture for him in, in like his his next years, like his retirement years when he's done working. That's what I want for him. But if he wants to just go to sleep, like he's he's had a, he's worked hard. If he wants to do the sleep research thing, I can totally respect that. But I think the world would be a better place if we had the Brixar National Lego Museum. I would love to see it. Next one, next one comes from uh, NC Family of Three. It says totally agree with you on the new iPhone 15 Pro and iPhones in general. I was talking about how like the the upgrades aren't aren't worth the juice isn't worth the squeeze. He says, my only predicament is that we bought our current phones, iPhone 14, before we started our channel. And we really regret that we didn't get the 14 Pro for the better camera. Yeah, I could I could see that. Plus it has the you can do the little zoom thing there too. He says, we're thinking about trading our 14 for the 15 Pro as the camera would be a big improvement for us. Before we started our channel, we generally skipped two models before upgrading. Previously we went from the eleven to the fourteen. Yeah, like if I didn't do YouTube, I had I had the here's my history. I had the six S, then I went to the eight. Then I went to the 10s. That was back when I used to skip every couple of years. And I went the 11 Pro. Then I skipped the 12 because they pulled the crap that they pulled this year with just doing the Pro Max upgrade. Then I went the 13 Pro. Very slight upgrade to the 14 Pro. And then that's where I'm at now. And I think I'm going to stay right where I'm at. But going from 14 to 15 Pro, I think could be enough of an upgrade to justify. Plus, they're going to give you a um, a trade-in, and you use the phone for your for your channel which could is potentially going to become a business i think it could be worth it that being said will any of your viewers know or care that you're using a 14 versus a 15 pro probably not 
just like no one is going to care or notice if I switch my microphone. Maybe people will notice. They'll be like, oh, that sounds kind of crispy, Greg. It sounds good, man. But have I lost any viewers because I'm using the Blue Yeti microphone? No. Will I gain any viewers or listeners in this case if I spend $500 upgrading my microphone? No. I think most people, and I, can, I can't speak for you, but if I had to guess, I would say most people are, aren't necessarily here because of how good or bad it sounds, but here to share in the journey, whatever that is, sometimes good, sometimes bad, just like we talked about this week. I think the story, and this is why I'm I'm trying to get away from the gear acquisition syndrome, as it's called, because I can go down the rabbit hole of looking at every camera view and looking at lenses and microphones, and uh, it, it's all just, it, it's all silly. It's all pointless. I'm not making the next Avengers movie. I'm not recording a, an album that's going to be listened to for the next hundred years. I'm literally sharing home movies of my day-to-day activities and sitting down once a week to talk about my life. How, how do the, the products that I have, which I have more than I, I need to do that, how do they not serve me in doing that proficiently? And the answer is they, they, do, they do great. I have more than I could ask for. If I, just like uh, Cool Factor was saying, if I never bought another thing again, I'd be completely fine. If I bought a $1,000 microphone, I think that'd be pretty awesome, right? It'd be great. And maybe maybe things will, my opinion will change once Black Friday hits and maybe I'll see a deal or something will come up. Who knows? But for like right now, I don't think I really need much of much of an upgrade. Like, in fact, I got really inspired by this guy. I was watching these videos he was shooting. He used to be a vlogger, but he kind of turned into more of an artsy dude. And his camera is like probably... The camera he uses, from what I remember, I think it's probably like seven years old right now. And he makes some incredible films using this old technology. Is he rushing out to get the, the greatest and newest and spending thousands of dollars and stuff? No. Are people not watching his stuff? No. Every one of the comments that I see on these videos is like, man, I love the story that you're telling here. I love the way this is. You're making true art. And I'm just like, wow, like I'm, I'm going down the wrong path. So like everything that I said last week about like all this new gear that I'm dreaming about and stuff, after seeing those videos and seeing the response to them, just got me thinking like how silly that all is, you know? Because I think I'm, I'm just fine. I'm fine with where I'm at. I mean, is it tempting to always want the new and greatest thing? Yes. Uh, if you are in a spot where the, the thing you're making is suffering because of what you have, like you're out trying to film your golf videos with the uh, iPhone potato, you know, that's one thing, <laughs> but you have a camera that literally costs $800 last year. You're probably going to be okay with, with making your videos to, to, to your audience with that. I mean, you can set goals and say, Hey, once I get a certain place, or maybe once I get monetized and uh, once I reach enough money to upgrade, I'll, I'll do that. But I just, I just don't know if it's necessary, but to each his own. And if it brings you joy, I would never take that away from someone. Next one comes from Outnumbered by Kids. Love it. it says, we just got, uh, this is, okay. We, we've gone down the, the highs and lows of this week, the roller coaster that is life. I'm going to give you a, a sad one, but then I'll give you a happy one. Let's start with Outnumbered by Kids. He says, we lost our two black labs this summer. One was 13, the other was 12. So hearing you mention soaking up those moments whenever you walk Roxy, really do because you just never know. Yeah, and I, I talk about this a lot and I think about this even more than I talk about it. Uh, anytime that I'm doing something with Roxy or just even like something as simple as when I lay in bed, her little bed's beside me. She has a dog bed. And sometimes I just listen to her breathing. You know how like dogs are on their side. They're just like heavy breathing when they're sleeping. And it just makes me feel so comforted, comforted listening to her breathe. Something as simple as that. But going for a walk and seeing her outside playing, knowing that like it is a little disappointing in some cases, I guess, because like I'll see, I saw one of those uh, ball flicker things that dogs can have. It's like a big plastic rod of sorts where the ball goes in and you can whip the ball. And I, and I started thinking like, oh man, there was a day where I could have got that for rocks and she would have sprinted and ran after that ball for half an hour. I used to run her until she, she couldn't do it anymore. Now I throw the ball once or twice and she goes and lays down on the grass. But even in those moments where I see her just kind of chilling there, I'm like, well, you know, she's still doing it. She's got her football in her mouth. She's happy. And um, like, ultimately, that's the most important thing. I always see these people at yard sales, like I mentioned, where 
you know, they have dogs and they talk about their dog is this age or they lost their dog and stuff. So I hear a lot of that. And every time I hear that, I'm like, well, man, I'm so thankful. Roxy's 12 and a half years old and she's still doing her thing. And I think about sometimes like, I don't know if this is going to be the last August that we have with her or the last September. Is this going to be the last time that she sees the, the snow or whatever? Last time she goes swimming at camp, is this going to be it? I think about that sometimes, but I also think like, I, I can't, think about that. I've got to think about how we're enjoying the time we have. And I always like to share these type of comments because I don't think you can necessarily just apply that to your dog. You can apply that to any aspect of your life. Something that you're doing now that maybe you'll never get to do again. Just try to live in it. Be like, wow, this is crazy. Like this is like, this is happening right now, you know, and, um, just try to appreciate it the best you can. Cause what is the quote? Like, you don't know you're in the good days until the good days are gone. Sometimes, sometimes that's the case. So there's our, our sad comment for the week. I'll send you out with a, with a very positive one that I guess is mostly just Ray. Who's our, what I, I would consider one of our biggest fans just being like super nice. And the, the smile the made me smile comment of the week and the, the motivating force behind everything that I do. We got Ray here who says, happy Sunday, Greg, five guys is well worth the price. And the portion size is incredible. A bag of fries is literally a bag of fries. You're, you're not kidding, man. And sticking with the food theme, thank you for mentioning the fry guy and giving him props. I talked about how I got really fascinated by watching someone working at McDonald's on like a point of view camera, like sharing how to make fries. I thought it was really cool. He says, it's always interesting to learn the logistics behind even the most mundane jobs. Having the knowledge of what it takes to make an end product may give people a pause before they attack a mistake. Tell that to any person that I see in videos at fast food places. It says, fast food workers work hard, and I am so thankful for them. They give me some of my life back. That is, that's a fact when you think of it like that. He says, the Greg theme is that, the Greg theme is spread across all your channels is love of life and people. Your dedication to Cody and Clark, as well as those of us who find value in the channel is priceless. As for a dream job, I love this, winning the lottery and being able to run an endowment. It'd be wonderful to be able to finance people uh, and causes that lift up the best part of mankind. Anyway, great podcast. Have a great week, guys. How about that for a send off from Ray? Holy smokes. You know, I, I don't know, Ray. But I think the sleeping job <laughs> is pretty sweet. But yeah, it would be fun just to have a job where you get to do nothing but give money away. It's, you live like the Mr. Beast lifestyle. It's kind of like what he, what he does. Um, but yeah, that'd be pretty cool. And uh, as always, I appreciate the kind words. I appreciate all you guys for tuning in to me talking about whatever it is I talk about each week. I find this very um, rewarding to to do this podcast. Uh, it's a bit of a therapy for me. And hopefully for you, it's, it's like uh, uh, you get to be a part of, uh, I guess, uh, a weekly routine where we get to sit down and chat, even if it is mostly one-sided, but I hope it's not because I would love it. If there was anything that I talked about this week, if you want to discuss that next week, I'll throw it out there. It really helps me with the podcast lengths. I know you guys like to have these things go for an hour. I already got to thank you for an hour of your time. So I feel the pressure, uh, throw it out there. I, I enjoy the listener feedback segments and I, I enjoy hearing back from you guys and making this more of a conversation than just me monologuing here. So on that, I hope you have a glorious week. Make it the best one of your life. And as always, we'll find you in the next Missing Pieces.